Hello everyone and welcome back to New Horizons. And if you've seen the previous episode, you'll know exactly where we are. Currently in darkness, but not to worry, we do have night vision. If I can hit the right key bind. There we go. <laughs> and at the end of this dark corridor lies our oil drilling rig, which should be automatically producing us raw oil. Let's give it a quick refuel. Oh, it has a lot of benzene here actually. Super tank is also full, this is a good sign, this will help us out today. I think we'll have to replace this. So I mentioned at the end of a previous episode, we want to start getting stuff automated, right? Really get into some of the fun stuff and start all the chemical and machine processing lines, expanding the base into the valley, upgrading power and the farms, playing around with some more Thorncraft. I'm having so much fun with Thorncraft this time around. And of course, we did manage to craft the nano suit last episode. Very fancy indeed. I still think these boots are way too fast. Handy for getting across this distance though, I will admit. So yeah, the plan is to reach space, Unlock Titanium, which in turn will unlock Tier 4 EV. And once we get to EV, we can start to unlock Applied Energistics. And all of this will allow us to do full automation, digital storage, all the amazing and fun things that we play modded Minecraft for, right? So that is the medium and long term goal. However, the base until then is going to look a bit garbage, a bit, um, what's the word for it? Von Sway? No, that, that's too organized for, for what we have here. Look at this, missing blocks in the pillars. <laughs> Things are going to be temporary until then, and we do have to make sure our infrastructure is on point. And one of the things that's off point right now is our lack of hydrogen. So we have all of this raw oil from the oil rig, goes through a distillery for sulfuric na naphtha. Apparently I was pronouncing this wrong. I think it's naphtha. Sulfuric, <laughs> sulfuric naphtha. And then it has to be desulfurized in hydrogen gas. So I know that some of you guys might disagree with this decision, but we are going to start electrolyzing water on circuit one. The electrolysis of water takes 100 seconds at LV, I'm sure. Wait a second. 100 seconds for two buckets and one cell. Or if we do circuit three, it's half the amount of water, but it gives us... Oh, it's, it's straight half the amount. And since we don't overclock here, it makes sense to go with this one. Okay. Okay, yeah. So I've just stolen water from this reservoir, which we also use to make sulfuric acid over here. And we added a fresh fluid pipe over here to get it into the electrolyzer. We used to have a centrifuge here for brown and yellow limonite. So I think we move the hydrogen tank up a block. That way we can automatically output down the fluid since we get this in a fluid slot. Then we can move the pipe for hydrogen up a block as well. And it just has to go into this chemical reactor here. So that works out perfectly. And then we have the oxygen cells. Unfortunately, the oxygen tank for this whole system is right here. So actually, we can just double conveyor these machines. And we should just be able to set import and allow input. That way it allows input from the output side, even though the output side is facing down, but it allows input through the cover. And then the same on the super tank, input and allow input. And that will take the filled cells of oxygen, place them inside the super tank where they empty out and go into the output slot. And then the tank sends them back to the machine. Yeah, pretty simple. And this one is running off a steam turbine. So it's effectively free, right? Since we have steam boilers. So this doesn't cost us anything except time and we have plenty of time. <laughs> awesome, I think this is gonna work out well for us. And we should be able to get lots and lots and lots of polyethylene. In fact, we already have quite a lot of polyethylene here, which we are gonna need for the next project. And of course the next project is gonna take some circuits. So once the hydrogen was going, I started to batch craft a whole bunch of circuits. LVs, MVs, and HVs. And I also use this as an opportunity to try to figure out where the bottlenecks lie, and also which resources we are short on. It's only really when you get into the swing of things and into the thick of crafting circuits that you really figure out what you need. And one of the things I've noticed that we immediately need is sanity. <laughs> no, no, I'm just playing. What we actually need is copper. Oh, hello, spider. That's a lot of spider. So in the previous episode, I moved the miner into the nether once again. I don't know how many times it's been here, but it's currently doing redstone. And this was for all of that energy and dust. Okay, this is a very bad place right here. Oh, there's a chicken there as well. Look at him. Look at this guy. You know what? We need to take him home with us. Oh, he only grabs the pigmen. What happens when we put him back? Nothing. <laughs> Yes, this thing is, oh my goodness, look at this. That is a whole lot of redstone right there and ruby. And of course, ruby equals chrome and chrome equals stainless steel. Oh, what a shot. 
yeah, one of the single most rare materials that we use in quite high quantities, relatively speaking, is gallium. We use this for SMDs, and of course, SMDs are used all over the place in the circuits. So the miner we just picked up from the redstone vein is now on a tetrahedrite vein, one of the best sources of copper. And the first miner, the MV1, which was previously on cassiterite sand, or tin, has now also been moved to the nether on a sulphur vein, which is how we get our gallium. So we're not quite finished crafting the circuits yet. We got a bunch of stuff going though in the machines behind me. And I think I'm going to spend an extra hour or two, legitimately, just, <laughs> just crafting circuits. I did want to point out how fruitful our decision to use chemical baths is for our nickel. So all of our nickel has went through these chemical baths. And look at this. Look at how much platinum we have. This is normally the stuff you guys don't normally see in the episodes, but I wanted to make sure to include it. I highly, highly recommend setting up chemical baths. And I think we also get it from thermal centrifuging. Yeah. We're not going to use all of this. However, some of it will go through the blast furnace. And whenever we do this, it only gives us... Oh, seven seconds? That's excellent. It only gives us nuggets. Yeah, so it's not... It's super inefficient to do this. It's not until we hit the EV tier, tier 4, where we can properly process this dust. The nuggets we can turn into... Oh yeah, look at all of this. Cooper nickel. <laughs> that is awesome. The nuggets we can turn into ingots, and then ingots into fine wire. And the fine wire we can combine with the crystals made from gallium and arsenic. Another use for the gallium. And then inside the assembler, we can get our SMDs. Not these guys. The these are the ones that we've profited from our polyethylene system. Yes, SMD diodes. And this replaces these uh, totally garbage regular diodes, which we've been previously buying from the quest book. Look at this guy here. I heard his footsteps and... <laughs> He's getting closer. You guys don't know how tempted I am just to hit this guy. Yeah, we're gonna leave him be. We're gonna leave him. As for the rest of this stuff though, it's very easy now that we have polyvinyl chloride. We can take this over to our double chemical reactor set up here. And the polyvinyl chloride, copper and sulfuric acid. I forgot, sulfuric acid we also make out here. This combines into the plastic boards. And then the plastic boards with more copper foil, which is the reason I moved the miner. And also iron 3 chloride gives us the plastic circuit boards. And this we use for all of the circuits. So yeah, I'm actually liking the way we've got this set up. Of course though, eventually it will all be fully automated. But now it seems our bottleneck for PVC is now switched to chlorine. Yeah, we're completely out of chlorine. However, chlorine is something that we're going to fix right now. Actually, you know what? Before we do that, I just want to share with you guys the level of satisfaction from crafting all these circuits. I'm at a point now where we kind of stopped counting. <laughs> like, I just kept filling up this diamond chest. And the circuit pile kept on growing. Yeah, look at this. There has been multiple chests looking like this. I just kept filling this thing up. <laughs> and our circuit pile grows. Look at this. This is actually the first time we're crafting the microprocessor, which is the very cheapest LV. This is such a glorious sight to see. Do keep in mind though that we are hundreds of hours deep into this playthrough, and so all of those circuits are probably like a week's worth of processing materials. <laughs> and we're just now getting the payoff, and oh my goodness, the satisfaction levels are through the roof for me right now. One last thing to make sure we're not sad when we're crafting circuits, it's going to be a howler alarm. As I've explained before, if this clean room is anything less than 100% efficiency, there is a very good chance we void items in the circuit assembler, and that's effectively wasted material. To ensure that isn't the case, we can use a needs maintenance cover, and this emits a redstone signal if it needs any maintenance. In fact, I think you can configure it, right? Yeah, so whenever there is one issue, it's going to emit a redstone signal, and that's going to go straight into a howler alarm. I'm going to turn the game sounds down because this is this is deafening, really. So if we invert this just to test. Oh yeah, there it is. You can hear it now. And that's with the game on 2%. So if there's ever any maintenance, we're going to know about it. Anyways, let's get on to this next project.
Alright, so after a substantial amount of crafting, I think it's time we start to spend some of these circuits. Not all of them, because we have some saved for our project next episode, but I think I've developed a bit of a game plan here, and there's going to be a lot of multitasking in the next half of this episode. Let's see if I've forgotten anything, or overlooked anything. <laughs> That's probably quite likely. Anyways, to start off with, the room used to end just after where the blast furnaces are. I've expanded it out another couple of sections just to fit in what we have planned today. And of course we have the same mirrored on both sides. I made sure to do at least the ceiling because that is the most annoying part to build. Especially when we don't have creative flight. So yeah, I like to dig it out in like sections of three, which is perfect for the hammer. You dig out like three blocks, then leave a block, which you can use to build the ceiling with. And then dig out up here and it works out quite well. But yeah, I think this is as far as we're going to take this room. Any further than this, it's going to interfere with what we have planned for out here when we expand into the valley. And this is going to be truly massive. I hope that I can realise the vision that I have for this place. We'll see, I don't know if I have the skill to pull it off, honestly. Okay, three, what the heck are we doing here? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> In the most flawless plan that I've ever developed, I can already see a million things going wrong today, but let's see. Oh, I missed that one. We are going to be aiming for polytetrafluoroethylene. So why is this important? We're going to be making another plastics here, which is more or less a direct upgrade to PVC. In fact, we can even use it for plastic circuit boards. However, I think we'll stick with PVC, at least in the beginning, for circuit boards. PTFE. <laughs> I'm going to call it PTFE from now on because polytetrafluoroethylene doesn't exactly roll off the tongue. Yeah, PTFE is going to be in quite high demand. So before we can start to make PTFE, we're going to actually expand our production capabilities here. So these are all MV machines. We have some MV gas turbines, as always. This is going to be connected with a fuel line. Do you guys remember last episode when I said we would be planning ahead by putting our miner in the twilight forest? Well, all of that cryolite... I thought there was more than that, right? Do we not have any more? <laughs> There's actually stuff everywhere. Like, our chests, uh, they've seen better days for sure. I'm sure we had more cryolite. Do I have a, a barrel for it? So, about 40 stacks of cryolite. This stuff we can turn through an electrolyzer. We can turn into 6 buckets of fluorine for every 10 dust. Good deal. And the electrolyzer we have right here, I have to constantly switch out between the trash can if we're electrolyzing clay dust. And we still occasionally electrolyze clay dust to get alumina, but this gives us water, which we just want to trash. And normally every other electrolysis recipe gives you either oxygen, which goes into this brand new arc furnace, and the arc furnace will turn iron ingots into raw iron ingots, copper into annealed copper, etc, etc. In fact, all of this raw iron we're going to pulverize, which is now full. We have some pulverized here. And do you guys remember at the beginning of the series when we had to constantly use these blast furnaces here? The bricked blast furnaces, which I still used up until about two days ago. <laughs> it looks like we still got some residual steel in here. Yeah, steel we still use all over the place. Well, now that we have a high enough heat coil, i.e. nichrome on the blast furnace, it's going to switch over, look at that, one second for a steel ingot. So yeah, we can produce steel extremely quickly now. It does cost two buckets of oxygen, but we, we have a lot of oxygen we can use. Anyways, back on track here with PTFE. Yeah, the electro... <laughs> I might be learning here why I cut out so much normally. I'm trying to include some more. This electrolyzer here, basically what I'm getting at is we have to constantly switch the output here for fluids. So we're going to make a dedicated system for centrifuging and electrolyzing, which gives fluid outputs. And quite a few fluid outputs. We'll need a tank for hydrogen, oxygen, of course. I know there's going to be some more. Nitrogen is another one. I think helium is also another fluid we have to take into account. Water, so probably just a trash can for water. I'm not going to go through all of these. Perhaps methane and helium. So yeah, that's like seven or eight fluids. I made ten super tanks, which are going to be placed here on the sides. Okay, so we're going to have a fuel tank here. This will be our input for benzene, and this has to go into this fuel line. Make sure to shut out all the pipes. And of course, give it a pump on the side of the tank. And then, of course, these things are going to give us items and fluids. And the perfect solution for this is the conduit. Item conduits will take care of the items, which are going to go into an, two buffer chests, I'm thinking right here. Maybe input and output. Yeah, and we can bring it around like this. Same on both sides. Actually, we still do want it to connect to the super tank. And just keep in mind, this isn't going to be perfect. There is going to be flaws with this, and I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. However, as I mentioned, we do have a bit of Von Sway going on. <laughs> so things are going to be a bit janky, at least in the early game. Anyways, the Ender Fluid Conduits. 
These are pipes which can have multiple fluids transported at once, perfect for our needs right here. And in fact, there's multiple tiers in GTNH, all with a different transfer rate. However, to make these, we do need PTFE, tiny PTFE fluid pipes, and polyethylene, and vibrant alloy, which is actually the first thing I missed today. Yeah, so we're just here for a few blaze rods. Haha, look at these guys through here. <laughs> Can't get to me now. I don't want to speak too soon though, because these guys can do some damage. Even in our nano suit. Okay, we got ourselves 13 blaze rods. And I do want to make sure we batch craft vibrant alloy. You might say 13 is not enough. And you know, I would probably agree with that. I think we're going to be bottlenecked by Chrome though, actually, which we also need for Vibrant Alloy. And I also believe we can get an extra chance output from the HV Macerator. So it takes three different materials to make Vibrant Alloy, Chrome, Ender Eye and Energetic Alloy. The Ender Eye we just taken care of, in fact, this drawer is now full again. This is like, what, our fifth drawer? <laughs> fifth full drawer of Ender Pearls, so this is definitely a worthwhile investment. Ah, uh, looks like we didn't quite get the full stack of Blaze Powder. It would be nice to get a full stack. Blaze powder and pearls in the chemical reactor gives us inner eyes. We still need a muffler for this machine. And also you might have seen me fill this mixer, it looks like at the wrong ratios. We, ha we should have a bunch of energetic alloy in here. I actually was remembering about this, but a bit too late because I think this takes a while through the blast furnace. Okay, so all in all we got ourselves 51 eyes of ender. We'll craft with 40. I like to craft in even numbers and build in odd numbers. Just because of the way Minecraft is built. And we have some chrome here. I always like to keep the materials here for stainless steel. Stainless steel is part of preparations for multiple episodes in the future. Okay, pulverize the Eye of Ender. Each recipe through the mixer gives us three dust. So in total, we ended up with two stacks and 16 vibrant alloy, which has to go through the blast furnace at least nichrome coils, at least MV tier, and we're running this thing at EV. And it also has to take hydrogen. Yes, 37 seconds. That's really not too bad. Considering it starts at 150 with hydrogen and 300 seconds without. <laughs> so it's a significant jump up and discount if we actually make sure to use hydrogen. Unfortunately, it looks like we're now overproducing hydrogen, which is a good sign. Yeah, and for now, we'll use a spare one of these tanks on this hatch. This thing was originally using nitrogen, and I think we'll eventually have one blast furnace per fluid type, per gas type. That's not something we can afford right now, though, so we have to keep switching them out. Okay, so we're now in a position where we have to make PTFE to finish this system. Unfortunately, there is a quest line for it, actually. It looks pretty simple, only two recipes. But no, we need even more hydrogen for this, our fluorine, which is going to make hydrofluoric acid. And this, it looks like, can be done at ULV, so we'll make an LV chemical reactor. Let's start pinning stuff as we go. This is normally the way I like to design chemical lines. So we have our source of fluorine, that's going to be through the electrolyzer. And we'll probably set it to one of these tanks so that we can easily input to the chem the next chemical reactor, which is going to be here. We're going to make PTFE in this space. As for hydrogen, I really don't know what we're going to do about this. I might just set up another electrolyzer for water on site here. And yes, I know that's super inefficient. <laughs> it is. Electrolyzing water is just the, the worst way to get hydrogen, but it's the cheapest and most passive way. So we'll see. We'll put a pin in that and come back to it. Okay, for now though, one chemical reactor. That should take care of the first quest, Teflon Dawn. We have to react hydrofluoric acid with chloroform. Chloroform, of course, being made of chlorine and methane. So chlorine, we are, we are gonna get from the electrolyzers. We're gonna electrolyze either salt or rock salt. This, it looks like, can also be done at LV. So let's pick up one more chemical reactor. Oh, we can't. Okay, one more chemical reactor. There's also the issue of methane. I honestly have no idea how we're gonna get methane. We could get it from propene, which is effectively an oil byproduct. But we're not really set up for that, so I don't think that's going to be an appropriate solution. Hydrogen carbon dust can also give us methane. But given the fact that we're short on hydrogen, I don't think that's going to work out too well for us. Yeah, that's something we'll come back to, I think. But then hydrofluoric acid and chloroform has to be combined together. Oh, looks like we also get a hydrochloric acid byproduct from making chloroform, which is something we'll have to deal with. Probably an electrolyzer. 36 seconds LV. And the chemical reactor making chloroform is 4 seconds at LV, so there's going to be a big bottleneck. Either we have to buffer it, the hydrochloric acid that is, either we buffer it or we make a higher tier of, of electrolyzer. The second to last step though, we have to combine the chloroform and the hydrofluoric acid together. That has to be at least HV chemical reactor, so we're going to steal this one. 
That's going to give us tetrafluoroethylene, and then the final step we combine with oxygen to give us polytetrafluoroethylene. Easy, right? <laughs> well, uh, we'll see. I've got a few more machines to craft and decisions to make with this, and we'll see how far we can get. Quick update on the polyethylene though, we just passed a thousand buckets. Not bad. So before we finish PTFE, I figured now would be a good time to make sure the oil rig is still running. So I went down to replace the super tanks. And it's actually, believe it or not, been enough time for both of the miners to finish, so I went back and collected both of those. And you know what? Why not place it straight inside our base? So this is going to give us both brown and yellow limonite. And actually, now that I'm thinking about it, this will centrifuge for hydrogen, and we'll use that in PTFE. Since we don't need PTFE quite as frequently as polyethylene, so we can survive on a backlog of limonite. Oh, this is such a good plan. <laughs> I'm a genius. <laughs> yes, look at this. Oh yeah, don't worry though, it's not going to leave a big crater underneath the base. I think only where the mining pipe is. Everything else will be replaced with cobblestone. We can easily patch up a one by one hole. Oh yeah, may I present to you PTFE. In fact, we already have our ender fluid conduits here, which I used to finish off the system. Once we established the order of the machines, I just moved the fluids and cells manually. Picked up the quest for the Vibrant Alloy, which is now finished through the Blast Furnace. Solidified the polytetrafluoroethylene into ingots. Then the extruder for Tiny Pipe. And then finally, the assembler for the fluid conduits. And this is a massive achievement right here. Having access to ender fluid conduits is going to make all of the chemical processing so much easier in this pack moving forward. Hello. Future 3 here. <laughs> so I've tried to explain this, I don't know, 5 or 6 times. And nothing was making any sense. I was just rambling to myself for like 30, 40 minutes. It was probably more than that. So let's try this again, shall we? So the whole thing works from right to left. This down here is the tank for benzene. That fills up three gas turbines. Two in the front, which feeds into a 4x battery buffer. And that feeds all six LV machines on the line. And the third gas turbine is for the necessary HV chemical reactor in the front. When we're dealing with single block chemical reactors, we do have the restriction of having to put one of the items inside a cell because there's only one fluid slot in the single blocks, which means we need some way to fill the cell. And there's two ways of doing that. The first way is with a fluid canner, which is this one, but this method costs us EU. So alternatively, we can use any GregTech tank. So we have two in the back here, one for chloroform and one for oxygen. So beginning from right to left here, we have chlorine and methane combining together for chloroform. That's extracted with the ender fluid conduits on magenta channel, and that gets inserted into the tank as a fluid. Then we give this some empty cells, and it's extracted as an item into the chemical reactor in here. And the same thing happens with oxygen. So oxygen is taken from primary oxygen storage, which also grabs from this electrolyzer centrifuge setup. So the oxygen is taken from this top tank, sent via fluid conduit into the tank here, where we give it again some cells, and then the cells are deposited as an item into the final chemical reactor to combine tetrafluoroethylene into polytetrafluoroethylene. One step previous to that is this chemical reactor up here, hydrogen and fluorine. Hydrogen is again taken from primary fluid storage here, so we have to fill this manually or we can get it from either centrifuging or electrolyzing various materials, whatever that may be. And then yeah, this is extracted as a fluid, put into the HV chemical reactor, then passed to the LV chemical reactor, and the LV chemical reactor passes it into a super tank, where we also have a fluid solidifier above. So most of the time, the polytetrafluoroethylene is used in fluid form. Occasionally though, in the case of the endofluid conduits, we need it in item form, ingot form specifically, for us to cast out into pipes. So we have a basic fluid solidifier here, which is also powered by the LV line on the back. So yeah, that's basically it. The outputs of these two chemical reactors feed into this one, feeds into this one, feeds into the tank. This electrolyzer here is the one I talked about for handling the hydrochloric acid byproduct. Gives us oxygen and hydrogen back, which are then sent into primary fluid storage again and then recycled. I did end up going with an LV one in the end. So this is our biggest bottleneck, but it's okay because this is semi-passive. It's okay if it's slow. And then of course we have the centrifuge up here, which centrifuges brown and yellow limonite. Oxygen is passed into the drawer and then extracted into primary fluid storage. And the hydrogen is extracted on red channel as a fluid. And that first goes 
into primary fluid storage and you guessed it, <laughs> recycled back into the system. So the final question, how do we get methane? Methane we can actually get from centrifuging logs. And we have so many, like we're swimming in logs. I don't know if that's the right analogy. <laughs> but yeah, one log can give us 60 litres of methane gas. So it's not the most efficient thing, but we have a very abundant supply of, of logs we can use. So I think it's best if we just use what we have. And we have 285 buckets of methane here. As for the centrifuge and electrolyzer setup though, there is quite a few flaws with this. But we're not going to stress about it too much because I don't know if I've mentioned before actually, but pretty much all of the plastics, all of the automations, almost everything you can see here is just temporary. And that's really one thing I want to stress with GTNH. I used to be really afraid of doing temporary automations, always trying to bide my time before I could get access to the best technology. But actually it's pretty necessary to set up temporary automations. Think about it like a stepping stone to get you to where you need to be. So yeah, like PVC, polyethylene, oxygen, hydrogen, even polytetrafluoroethylene, which we just set up is probably, well, is definitely going to be rebuilt at some point. Although I think we will keep what we have, just so we can come back and see where we started. There is also an argument to be made that we shouldn't have automated PTFE like this and we should have went with the LCR. The large chemical reactor has more functionality. It's a bit more flexible. Honestly though, I think this is going to work out just fine for us. It's only meant to tide us over until we get AE2. However, all of these chemical reactors are uh, scrambling my brain right now, so... I did take a little break and... You see, I was in the Twilight Forest hunting ravens for their feathers. And those guys gave me some target practice, that's for sure. We also came across some more Thumbcraft nodes. And I was doing a bit of research in order to unlock the Mantle of the Raven. Which I believe is a quest. Flying like an eag. <laughs> so apparently this goes in the cloak slot. I'm not actually sure what that is. Is it under equipment? Alright, oh, I guess it's up here. Oh, look at this thing. Oh, look at this. <laughs> Maybe we should take off our backpack. Oh, check this out. This is awesome. This thing is crazy. <laughs> So from what I understand, this thing gives us increased creative flight speed. So basically any time we're flying, we're much faster. Oh, you know what? Maybe we try it with the nano bits of the traveler. Hold on. <laughs> that is crazy. We can just launch ourselves. We don't even need this hang glider anymore. And not only that, actually. Not only that. Not only do we look like... <laughs> I mean, I don't know what we look like. This is awesome. I believe this thing also gives us immunity to fall damage. Complete immunity to fall damage. And if you're wondering where it is, by the way, it's in the Witching Gadgets tab. I believe you need Spinning Wheel, Bewitched Fleece, then Cloak, and then Mantle of the Raven. <laughs> oh, this thing is so awesome. <laughs> Thank you, by the way, Metis, for... He's been bugging me about this since Season 1. And I kept putting it off, but honestly, I should have got it much, much sooner. This thing is so cool. And it's not even really that expensive either. Fortunately, there is actually a keybind for it, so... I think we can disable it. And by the way, it's this keybind here, Traveler's Gear Active Abilities. I believe this still gives us fall damage immunity, which is super cool. <laughs> it's kind of a shame it clips through the backpack like that though. So the flaws with this system, what are they? Well, first of all, all of these torches everywhere. And I think I might have just stumbled across my new favorite Thomcraft spell. The one focus of illumination. Yeah, so you can dye this a whole bunch of different colors. I tried out black, orange, blue, and white. Maybe you guys can let me know which one you prefer. I'm leaning towards either orange or black. I think blue doesn't really fit. It's not really the right color of blue, and the white might be a little too bright. But yeah, I think they are permanent, and they only cost us a little bit of V on the wand. So we can basically use these all over the place, which I'm super happy about because that spell is... <laughs> it's so fun to cast. So we have our two input chests like we had before. One for the electrolyzer, one for the centrifuge. And these are taken out on different item conduit channels. One is on brown, one is on purple. So that's for item insertion into the machines. Can you guess what the first flaw is? So program circuits in the machine determine which recipe you want to run. Yeah, you can see for example here, this is circuit 11 for salt water. Whereas it's circuit 1 for hydrochloric acid. And there's no way to change this either automatically. Which is one of the benefits to the LCR, as you can have multiple input hatches and send the fluids to where you need to go and have the LCR run multiple recipes. But with single blocks, we don't have that luxury, so we have to just accept that we have to change this manually. So once we electrolyze cryolite, we get sodium and aluminium. That's extracted on the blue channel for items, and that goes into the output chests here. 
And then the fluorine is also extracted on blue except on the fluid channel. And that's inserted into the super tank here. Because we have the awesome feature of being able to lock tanks now, we actually don't even need any filters on the fluid insertion. However, sometimes in the case of, for example, I don't know, lanthanite, when we electrolyze this, we get the cells of oxygen and hydrogen. And in this case, it will actually accept the wrong cell. It will happily accept fluorine in the hydrogen tank, which means we do have to set some filters here for the cells. And then all the empty cells from every single tank is extracted on black. And that goes back into the input chest to be put back in the machine. The other flaw is theft. <laughs> and I guess I should have saw this coming. But basically, some of these processes over here require empty cells. For example, the chloroform and hydrofluoric acid. We have to give this two empty cells to run the recipe so that it has enough to output hydrochloric acid. And sometimes, for example, when we recycle the oxygen in here, right, it goes to primary fluid storage. And then this extraction here takes it out and puts it into this closed loop system. And it never ever makes its way back over here. So I don't really know a solution for that. And we don't have any limited item fillers in this pack. That's only in 1.12. And round robin, I believe for conduits, round robin only applies if you have multiple items to be extracted at once. But let's say this runs the recipe, gives us three empty cells back. The three empty cells will be round robin, but then the next three that come through is going to reset. So it's going to go to the same three machines. I don't really know how to fix that, honestly, other than fixing it manually. So I think we just have to accept that there's some manual processes with this. And finally, we can come in with some facades just to hide all the conduits. It might look a bit too flat like this, though. I'm not sure. Oh, yeah. And of course, we have the trash can down here, which is filtered to only accept water. That's for clay dust, which I have been uh, electrolyzing a fair amount of. And then there's one more item conduit up there. So this is actually for fluorine. We send it into a separate tank so that we can fill cells. And then the cells are passed over to the first chemical reactor in the line here. You know, I feel like there's just so much to do and not enough time <laughs> for GTNH. But we are going to wrap up the episode right here. Thank you all so much for watching and I hope to see you all in the next episode of New Horizons.